Welcome to GTS Car Life. I'm Thomas. If you love cars and everything car culture, GTS Car Life is for you. GTS Car Life is dedicated to presenting today's cars and car culture by car guys for car guys. If you had to pick an affordable, reliable sports car to be your daily driver, what would it be? Today, we take a look at the 80s classic, this 1985.5 Porsche 944. Porsche built the 944 in its various guises from 1983 to 1991. For 1992, Porsche made major changes to the car and renamed it the 968. This final version would be produced until 1995 when it, along with its fellow transaxle stablemate, the 928, would end production. Going forward, all Porsche sports cars have been either rear or mid-engine. No discussion of the 944 would be complete without mention of its immediate predecessor, the 924. In the early 70s, Porsche needed a replacement for its current entry-level car, the 914, which had been a joint project with Volkswagen. Porsche planned to stop production of air-cooled rear and mid-engine cars, switching to water-cooled front-engine, rear transmission, and drive axle cars. These first two transaxle cars, as they became known, were the 1977 Porsche 924 and 1978 Porsche 928. The 924 would serve as Porsche's entry-level model and replacement for the 914. The 928 was to replace Porsche's flagship model, the 911. The 924 was intended to be sold jointly with Volkswagen, as had been the case with the 914. Changes in the economy and to Volkswagen's management staff brought the end to the 924 program at Volkswagen, which decided to move forward with the Golf-based front-wheel drive Scirocco as its sportiest offering. Since Porsche had spent many resources and time developing the 924, they made arrangements to purchase the rights to the car in a deal which included sourcing key components like the engine and suspension from Volkswagen Audi. The 924 was launched in 1976 as a 1977 model in the United States and was a commercial success. The Porsche purists, however, shunned the car as not being a real Porsche, noting that its two-liter four-cylinder engine was a modified Audi 100 engine. To bolster its image, Porsche began racing the 924, eventually widening its track by adding fender flares and adding a turbo to make it more competitive. The 924 Carrera GT would be produced in very limited quantities near the end of the 924's run, and its styling served as the basis for the forthcoming 944. It's no wonder then that most people see a lot of race car cues in the 944 body. Launched in 1982, the 944 not only looked more muscular, athletic, and aggressive, but it featured an actual Porsche design and built engine. The 944's 2.5 liter four cylinder engine was essentially half of the flagship 928's five liter V8. Producing 150 horsepower and 142 pound feet of torque, the engine incorporated Mitsubishi designed twin balance shafts to control the vibration inherent in a large displacement four cylinder engine and sat in the engine bay at an unusual 45 degree angle to both facilitate installation at the factory and minimize wear over time. The 944 combines terrific styling that looks both sleek and aggressive at the same time. I've always found the 944 to be one of the most perfectly styled and balanced sports car designs in existence. Visibility is first rate with plentiful glass and thin pillars, the long hood slopes away to reveal the road in front of you during the day, and the now unusual but surprisingly popular pop-up headlights at night. Most controls fall readily to hand, though using them requires a bit of deciphering for the unfamiliar. If you are familiar with the 911 of the time, you won't have much difficulty quickly figuring out the 944's controls. If you are used to today's cars, you may scratch your head a few times before figuring out how to do simple things like adjusting the power mirrors, opening and closing the power sunroof, or adjusting the dashboard lighting. The immediate impression is that this is a very well-built and solid car. It reminds you of the 911s of the time, sharing things like that wonderful Porsche door slam sound, quirky interior controls, high back bucket sport seats, and the always welcome and familiar Porsche leather smell. Materials seem of a high quality and everything feels very solid and sturdy. It is easy to understand how this car still looks brand new after 35 years and 50,000 miles. The large sunroof covers the majority of the roof surface area and can be tilted up for venting at the back via an electric motor 
or completely removed for a near Targa-like experience. Porsche included a sunroof cover for storing the panel in the cavernous trunk when not in place. Once underway, the 944 drives very much like a Porsche of the day. Step firmly on the gas, and you are reminded of how far performance cars have come in the last 35 years. What was once considered very fast for its time feels a bit more leisurely today. Zero to 60 takes approximately eight and a half seconds, which was far better than most of its competitors. The 944 will pull all the way to 130 miles per hour. It's worth noting that there are a few simple, relatively inexpensive modifications available, which really sharpen the handling and improve power. I've driven a 944 with the upgraded turbo sway bars and a Lindsay Racing Mass Airflow intake kit, and that car drove very much like you would expect in a modern Porsche. I'll include the parts list in the notes below. At speed on track, I was very pleasantly surprised by how well this car hustles. It is very smooth and fluid, making small work of both tight turns and long sweepers. The steering is slower than today's sports cars, making it a bit more challenging through the slower turns, but the car was effortless to drive through both medium and large sweepers and turns. I found myself going much faster around the track than what I had been anticipating. I suppose I really shouldn't have been that surprised. Classic or not, this is a Porsche, and if there's one thing Porsche knows how to do, this was it. The five-speed manual transmission feels wonderfully mechanical and precise. For those looking to capture that fast disappearing analog driving experience, a 944 delivers it in spades. Car Driver Magazine pronounced the 944 to be the best handling imported car of its time. Best in cars like the Ferrari 308, Lotus Esprit, Audi Quattro, and even Porsche's 0911 and 928. If you push it, a 944 still hustles and is capable of providing endless ear-to-ear -ear smiles on demand. Those famous Porsche anchor overboard brakes work as well as ever, though handling and braking are compromised by today's lack of high-performance tires in the required size. The slightly larger and optional Fuchs wheels do allow for modestly better tire selection, plus they just look great. The upside is you can put new tires on all the way around for about $300, which is close to what you'll pay for just one tire on a new 911. This was an aspirational car for many. Prices started around $20,000 when first introduced in 1982. This well-optioned 1985 model stickered at $27,110. By comparison, a 1984 Volkswagen GTI cost around $9,000 during the same period. So the 944 was certainly premium, but almost within reach for so many enthusiasts. Porsche would introduce more powerful, naturally aspirated variants, including a 190 horsepower 944S in 1987. The later turbo models produced between 220 to 250 horsepower were prohibitively expensive by comparison and while much faster and better handling, the turbo models suffered from high maintenance costs and less than stellar reliability due to excessive engine compartment heat from the turbocharger. It is worth noting that today, some 35 years later, the turbo models can command a premium of more than two to three times the price of a naturally aspirated 944. So if you want the hottest version for occasional Sunday drives and are prepared to pamper it and pay for it, the 944 Turbo will provide you with a next level experience when you take it out. For daily driver duty, my suggestion is a naturally aspirated 944 like this one. It's not uncommon to find 944s driving around with over 200,000 miles on them. These cars are very straightforward, relatively simple to work on with plentiful and inexpensive parts. This car is still on its original clutch, and I've seen 944s with over 100,000 miles still running the original clutch. And that's a good thing because one area where a 944 is not easy to work on is clutch replacement. The transaxle design, which gives this car its near 50-50 weight distribution, also provides for major headaches when you need to replace that clutch. Most do-it-yourselfers probably won't want to attempt this, and a Porsche specialist is going to charge you much more than you would have to pay on a more pedestrian car. As with any car, there are a few inherent weak spots. Never reset the triple odometer while the car is moving. Porsche inexplicably designed the mechanism to break the odometer if you hit reset while the car is driving. This issue existed for several years. This phenomenon also means that it is common to find 944s out there with many more miles than indicated, so be aware. Check service records and look for consistent, gradual mileage increases over time. Most of the faulty odometers were never repaired, so you may never know the true miles on an affected car. 
Another common problem is delamination of the rear window frame from the glass hatch. This is almost inevitable and there is no easy or inexpensive fix. Rattling or creaking of the frame around the glass is your first clue and in extreme cases, water leakage into the hatch can happen. Most owners try some sort of home remedy with a silicone caulk, which while effective at preventing water intrusion, does not actually fix the problem and usually results in an unattractive mess. My best advice is to use two hands to evenly apply pressure when closing the hatch. Also, because the 944 was such a tremendous sales success for Porsche, the large amount of 944s in existence kept prices down until recently, meaning that current owners would rarely spend much money on the required maintenance and repairs. Today, most 944s have been either trashed or turned into race cars. Finding a pristine example with records like this one is not easy. When you do, expect to pay top dollar. These cars have increased in value two to three times over in the past 10 years or so. Also, worth noting is that the 944 engine is what's known as an interference engine. So it is critical that timing belt service intervals are adhered to. It is always a smart move to make sure you get full service records on any Porsche or other premium European car. In the event records aren't available for the car you want to purchase, you'll be wise to invest in preventive maintenance and replace both belts, as well as a few other parts while the car is in for service. 944s are very reliable cars by nature, especially compared to other European sports cars. But like any car, they do need to be kept up. So what is it like driving this Porsche 944, a 35 year old classic sports car? Really nice actually. Dependable, rock solid, beautiful, special in so many ways and very daily drivable. There are many fine choices in this price range, including newer and faster sports and sporty cars. There are cars with anti-lock brakes, airbags, and other more modern conveniences. But few cars can take you back in time, provide that true analog driving experience as beautifully and convincingly as a 944. If the Porsche 944 has been on your mind, go ahead, scratch that itch. You'll find an immensely enjoyable and now rather rare classic sports car worth owning and one that will provide a rewarding and satisfying driving experience for many, many years. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking and subscribing below so you won't miss our next episode. And I'd like to know, what would your choice be for a reliable, affordable daily driver? Please let me know in the comments below. Have a great day, be safe, and I'll see you out there.